Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And I would like to thank everyone for taking time of their, out of their uh, days. For those of you on the east side of the country, it, I know it's uh, nighttime right now, 6 p.m. Eastern time. I'd like to talk to you about this very important uh, topic on Parkinson disease device-aided therapies in what uh, uh, you had mentioned as a progressing Parkinson disease in the movement disorder world, we say advanced Parkinson disease. I'm going to clarify some definitions as well. So I do want to start off with uh, listing disclosures here, and I, and I thank the, the Parkinson Society for having me speak. And an overview of what we will be discussing today include uh, starting off with some background and definitions that are quite important. Um, progressing advanced Parkinson disease signs and symptoms and the concepts and definitions around motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Uh, device assisted therapies, those that are currently approved and available. Uh, so we're not going to talk about things that are uh, off label or, or still in research phases. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to bring up when to have the conversation with your neurologist about pursuing device aided therapies, at which uh, time would be best to um, look into that with your neurologist and the appropriate referral will be made to your subspecialty movement disorder center. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of today's session, but we'll limit to the discussion as far as this talk is concerned to, um, uh, to these topics. Uh, the goal is not to give advice on how to adjust your medications, um, and that would be left to your neurologist. So uh, a very important thing to do in, in these talks is to, to give a background overview, uh, just to cover the scope of um, uh, Parkinson disease and the progression itself. M for many of you, this might be repetition, something you've already gone through with your neurologist. Uh, there are many patients and caregivers uh, that are uh, attending this talk tonight, and, uh, and uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, Parkinson's disease, as you may all know, is it's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's dementia. It is a clinical diagnosis often made and managed by a neurologist. Um, the cardinal features include bradykinesia, so that's slowness of movement. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of patients may have a, a rest tremor. Uh, the classic rest tremor of Parkinson disease and uh, rigidity or stiffness. Um, and of course, as neurologists, we also want to ensure there are no other causes of secondary Parkinsonism or red flags to suggest another disorder. Uh, there is no cure as of yet, but symptomatic treatments are available to improve quality of life. And they often do require adjustments in treatment over the years. Uh, the gold standard of therapy being levodopa therapy, which is essentially replacing what's missing in the uh, uh, in people with Parkinson's disease who have degeneration of those dopamine producing cells in the areas of the brain that do fine tune movement. And thus by that degeneration lead to the slowness, the stiffness, the tremor of Parkinson's disease. Um, and over time uh, that uh, a requirement of medications does need to be adjusted. Oftentimes the schedule of their levodopa might need to be made a bit more frequent or add on therapies to smooth out the day and their, and their function is often necessary. The typical onset of Parkinson disease is uh, 55 to 65 years of age. Uh, certainly we see patients much younger than this and we do see patients older than this. Um, it does occur in one to 2% of people by the age of 60 and one in 25 by the age of 80 to 85. 0.3% uh, of the population is affected and it's slightly more so in men than women by about one and a half to one. So it was slightly, slightly more. In 2011, and this, this is some old data, but it's very, it's very relevant in estimating future numbers of Canadians living with Parkinson's disease, that number in 2011 was 85,200, and that will double by 2031. The term uh, progressing or advanced. Uh, so when the response to dopaminergic therapy of motor symptoms become shorter, and when motor fluctuations and dyskinesias develop is what we as the movement disorder uh, a neurologist would call advanced. These are major causes of impairment and reduced quality of life. I want to be clear here though, advanced does not mean late stage. Late stage is when patients are severely disabled with symptoms that are not responsive on their best medical therapy, such as having recurrent falls due to uh, freezing of gait despite their levodopa or other dopaminergic treatment at the stage where they have cognitive impairment that would be late. Swallowing is severely impaired at that stage and this is when patients are often essentially fully dependent on others for activity of daily living. 
So that would be a late stage. That is not the same as advanced. The progression of Parkinson's disease in general, and this is using our traditional scale called the Honan Yar scale of stages, takes approximately to get from five to seven years to go from one stage to the next. And, and what that means is these are not perfect stages uh, because patients can be quite disabled um, as they advance and still have those fluctuations in their response to treatment, despite being in what the stages would report you as a stage one or two, which is an early stage. Stage one essentially just describes, and this is why it's not ideal, all it describes is one side of the body being affected. And that's usually how patients with Parkinson's disease present. One side of their body starts off with a tremor, stiffness, and slowness. After about five years or, or slightly longer, it might start to affect their other side, maybe to a milder degree. And then stage three would be some mild balance difficulties, stage four, more severe balance difficulties, usually requiring a, a walking aid. And stage five is essentially full assistance in their uh, very immobile. Um, this, the caregiving by the caregivers, uh, patient, family members, a spouse will gradually change from mild to substantial over the period of development of Parkinson's disease over that course and specialized care by neurologists have been shown to improve outcomes. Typically patients uh, present to subspecialty neurology clinics at stage two, that's not always the case and we're trying to uh, make it earlier. Uh, and over uh, a period of 12 to 15 years, as they, it takes about 12 to 15 years before they reach stage four or later. The Parkinson Society is advocating for subspecialty care to optimize outcomes. That's the goal of improving quality of life in patients with Parkinson disease. The uh, patients with early onset Parkinson disease, that is less than 50 years of age when they first present with symptoms, are a bit slower to reach later stages. Uh, later onset patients over 60, there's a gray zone between 50 and 60, but over 60, uh, and longer disease duration are associated with greater disability. The duration of disease is as important as the age of onset of disease. So again, to reiterate, Advanced stages, most patients respond well to levodopa, but 40 to 50% will develop motor fluctuations and dyskinesia within five years, 70 to 80% after 10 years of treatment. So it's not a small number. What are motor fluctuations? They're unexpected variations in the motor response, which can be erratic, and they are to the dopaminergic therapy. So for example, when in, whereas in early stages, when you're still having uh, 30 to 70% of your own dopamine producing neurons still available, then you might get away with fewer dosings of levodopa during the day, maybe one tablet three times a day, five, six hours apart. And that might be for the first couple of years. After a few years, you might notice that it's working well, but it may wear off at the end of the dose. And then you might need one tablet four times a day, about four hours apart. The, that's an example of the end of dose fluctuation where you might have to adju adju adjust the schedule and not just increase the dose. Uh, sometimes we can add on therapies that might help prolong that effect so that you're not um, having to jump to taking a dose every three hours, for example, too early on. But many patients over time might need that frequent dosing of, of their levodopa as an example of the more common medication we use. Um, dyskinesias are unwanted, uh, abnormal, intrusive, uh, predominantly uh, choreiform. That means dance-like writhing movements resulting from levodopa. Dyskinesias may indicate better response to medication. And most patients might describe preferring to be on than with dyskinesias than being off where they're stiff and slow and their mobility is significantly impacted. Uh, on the next slide, I wanna highlight that we have to understand the difference between an off and on. So you can have dyskinesias and not necessarily be off. Uh, you, you could be on with dyskinesias. Um, certainly, there's some, there are some caveats where dyskinesias can be troublesome and be at the beginning or end of dose. Um, but the, one of the more common things we see is at the peak dose. The off periods, another definition here, is when the motor symptoms of Parkinson's predominate, often with severe bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor, and reduced mobility. The on period, which is what you want, are the beneficial effects of the medications with improvements of those motor symptoms. And there are a number of different types of motor fluctuations and the approach and treatment strategy is different. So wearing off end of dose fluctuations is a shortened duration of response to each individual dose of levodopa. So before your next dose is due, you might say, 
uh, yeah, I'm good for three and a half hours, but in that last half an hour, I'm wearing off as I'm approaching my next dose. They could be a delayed on, which is an increased latency uh, period uh, from the intake of the uh, a pill to the onset of response. There could be a no on or failure of the oral levodopa dose to induce an on. That might be more common after food or in the afternoon. There could be a sudden off. So you could be good and suddenly the, the effects abruptly, randomly and unpredictably, unpredictably lose benefit. There could be an unpredictable on. So it's a variable on and off period throughout the day that do not temporarily correlate to specific dose timing. Dyskinesias are involuntary irregular writhing movements that we mentioned. They can range from mild to violent and can sometimes be unpredictable. These uh, typically occur at a rate of 59% at 10 years. They are a bit more common with early onset Parkinson's disease to occur earlier. That means patients less than 50 and in women is what we found from studies. About 12% of patients have the very troublesome dyskinesias where they might slide out of a chair because their legs are going or they might trip over their own feet when they're walking. Um, oftentimes when they're mild, it might be noticed by a family member or caregiver before it's, it even troubles the patient. Um, and they might not always need to be treated. Again, especially if they're on, but with dyskinesia, but they're still mo re really well, uh, mobile and they don't have much in the way of residual rigidity, radiokinesia or tremor. There are a number of different types of dyskinesia. And so that can be um, uh, peak dose. It could be beginning, end of dose, which is also called diphasic. And uh, in some cases, the dyskinesia might not be that dance-like phenomenon that uh, you may be familiar with, but it could also be a form of dystonia where there's an involuntary contraction or twisting of the muscle that can be very uncomfortable. Some, some people might experience in early stages of a, a, a cramping toe, and that might be a, a, an off dystonia, and that certainly can be treated with medications, but in, in less common circumstances, but certainly can occur, it can be manifest as an on dystonia that could be fairly difficult to treat. There are also non-motor fluctuations. So we talked about what can happen in off with respect to the motor symptoms coming back. Their non-motor fluctuations could be, if we take the example of an end of dose wearing off, if it's, if it's fairly obvious that you have levodopa responsive symptoms that might include uh, at the end of the dose, just as an example, as a, as, a, as a fluctuation of more slowness of thought at that time, just feeling generally unwell, anxious, short of breath, palpitations, uh, mood related changes, but, that, but then you have your dose and when it finally kicks in, you feel better, that could be a non-motor fluctuation. We know about non-motor symptoms being part of Parkinson's disease, but there can also be non-motor fluctuations that are responsive to levodopa. And similar approaches as with managing motor fluctuations are recommended, adjusting the medications, or now we're gonna get into soon device-aided therapies. To manage motor fluctuations, typically making sure that we're optimally uh, absorbing the medication. So that might be modifying meal schedule. Uh, levodopa is a protein, it's an amino acid. So it's a breakdown product of protein. Like I said, we naturally produce it in our brain, it gets converted to dopamine. We're now we're taking it as a pill form. It has to be absorbed. It has to get across the bloodstream into the brain, into the right target, and needs to be converted to dopamine there. Dietary proteins, if you have a bolus of protein at the same time of your levodopa, it might interfere with who gets across first, across the, the gut into the, in the small intestine called the jejunum. And so we typically, as movement disorder specialists, may recommend to maximize absorption to take your levodopa one hour to before, two hours uh, after any main meals or protein. Certainly because of nausea or discomfort that can happen with levodopa, you can take it with a fruit or cracker, big glass of water, but at least wait an hour before you have your dairy and other proteins, meats and lentils, legumes, peanut butter. Uh, one other thing we can do is medication management, of course. So increasing the frequency of levodopa, raising the total dopaminergic supply by increasing the individual dose or adding adjunctive treatments. And many of you are familiar who are attending this talk. These are the medications we have available right now. And so here's our gold standard. This medication has been consistently shown to improve uh, symptoms of quality of life more effectively throughout the course of Parkinson's disease. Um, going through how to select and manage dosing of these medications is beyond the scope of this talk and would, should be discussed if you have any questions with your neurologist. But for example, an end of dose wearing off, you might uh, uh, switch to three times a day, five hours apart to four times a day, four hours apart, but then you might have wearing off half an hour before that fourth hour comes up 
and you and your you might speak to your uh, neurologist about adding a medication called entacapone. And uh, for some reason, it wasn't added to the slide, but that might extend the effect of levodopa. Other options might be one of these medications, the monoamine oxidase B inhibitors that, uh, uh, that prolong the effect of dopamine, allow it to last longer, dopamine agonists that directly target dopamine receptors. These medications over here, amantadine and anticholinergics, sometimes this might be uh, difficult to tolerate in more um, elderly patients uh, because of risk of conf uh, worsening confusion if they're at risk for that, but otherwise they're mainly reserved for treating tremor. Amantadine could, be, could treat dyskinesia. It is a treatment for, that we use for dyskinesia, tremor, and in some cases, freezing of gait. What this next slide shows is that over time in Parkinson's disease, as you go from left to right, there is a narrow therapeutic window and it becomes more challenging to manage a patient's fluctuations, including the offs in dyskinesia. And so I'm gonna to try to put my, air, uh, my arrow here. So in mild stages with the fluctuations as they begin, uh, it, uh, there's very minimal fluctuations in the early stages. You, you have options to start with levodopa, a dopamine agonist such as pramipexol, um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors such as selegiline or risagiline. And then fluctuations start to begin. You can adjust the dosing of your levodopa, the frequency, adding one of these medications if they haven't already been started. And then when they become quite severe, uh, then, then we have to start thinking of device-assisted therapies to kind of smooth out your day-to-day your -day, uh, course, your, over one day, hour-to-hour uh, -hour even. And we do have currently uh, two advanced surgical options that are approved. And so the, um, uh, the right time for not the, our, the first one I'm gonna talk about today, DBS, and the second one is levodopa carbidopa delivered as an intestinal gel infusion via a tube. It's called a PEG-J tube, percutaneous endoscopic uh, gastric jejunostomy. Um, the, the term is less important than, than what I'm gonna describe in the, uh, in the slide, um, is, is when your medications still work, but just not as well as they used to, the examples I gave earlier. Okay, and research in these medications show that um, patients usually have Parkinson's for at least four years at minimum, and sometimes patients in, in these studies are, were included at 12 years. You might still be a, a, a good responder to levodopa. When you're on, you're great, but when you're off, and that can be very erratic throughout the day and unpredictable, uh, certainly you're still a candidate uh, as long as you're still having a good on response. Um, so the right time is to discuss when they're still in fact working. And so let me go through them with you. Uh, the DBS is, deep brain simulation is like a pacemaker for your brain. It consists of a uh, lead. Let me see if I can get my arrow working here. So it, can, it contains of uh, the lead, which is implanted in the respective target. And there are a couple targets your neurologist or neurosurgeon would choose. The connecting wire that goes underneath the skin, you do not see this an implantable uh, uh, pulse generator, also, also known, uh, we can consider it like a pacemaker. And, and that is just underneath the skin over your, over your chest muscle. And uh, a programmer that the neurologist has to program the settings. A patient controller where there might be room for you to adjust the settings and check the battery and or, the, and or a magnet. Um, your, uh, there are a few targets. So one is the subthalamic nucleus, one is the globus pallidus interna, um, and that would be something decided with your neurologist or neurosurgeon what the best target is for you. You can consider whether one side or doing both sides. Oftentimes we do both sides as patients at some point or even at the time they present would be affected on both sides of their body. And so uh, just to give you an example of how the targets are different, the globus pallidus, for example, might be a bit more effective for uh, might be effective for tremor, rigidity, the slowness, the motor fluctuations, dyskinesia, dystonia, and the subthalamic nucleus. In fact, over time, although initially one might have been better for tremor or dystonia, over the next two to three years, they found in studies that they're fairly equal. Um, the, the GPI is something we still use in, in forms of dystonia that might even not be related to Parkinson's disease. There may be an other target that I didn't include here because it's mainly used for tremor, but it doesn't address the other symptoms. It's an area called the thalamus, the, the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. And that's typically what would be used in deep brain simulation for people with a, another form of tremor known as essential tremor. Um, typically uh, uh, the batteries are last about five years depending on how much voltage you need. Uh, and that would, that would completely be individually determined. 
Uh, so that's uh, 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 taken on a on a case to case account. It has been around for 30 years. Uh, about a, almost a thousand hospitals around the world have been involved in this. It's per, been performed in the US and Canada for Parkinson's disease within the past two decades. Uh, there was a recent study that showed that uh, 10 per million population per year were undergoing uh, DBS surgery in, in our country. And there's almost a, near 100,000 uh, around the world uh, for all indicated conditions for DBS. Uh, DBS is used for a few other con conditions outside of Parkinson's, but the, uh, the uh, approval in US and Canada came for Parkinson's disease fairly early on in the last two decades. Um, a three-year follow-up study did show that both, tar both targets in, in, in outcomes was fairly equal. Um, there, so the, the risks, some of you may, may wonder, well, what, what are my risks? With, and most surgeons that do this are quite experienced. There, there are a few sites in Canada that do it for Parkinson disease specifically. The reason why I put that caveat is that Sunnybrook does it for other conditions that they're trialing it. Uh, but for Parkinson disease, it's uh, Ottawa at Toronto Western and, uh, and in London, Ontario. There are uh, sites in uh, most provinces around the country, um, except for uh, PEI, I believe, and I'm, I'm not sure if New Brunswick does it, but I may, be, I may stand corrected by someone in the audience. Um, the need for battery replacement, it, we talked about that, and there are certainly options for a rechargeable device. Let me talk to you about the risks in a, in a few more details. So uh, the total risk, is about three to five percent and that includes all of the things listed on this slide here so seizures bleeding in the brain a stroke infection and potentially death the rate of death is much lower than that three to five percent but this is taken everything into account in some cases there can be a problem with the device itself uh, such as a break in the wire, and that would require a, a repair uh, and movement of the wire device underneath the skin occasionally you can have um, a wearing down of the skin where the battery is placed in the chest and that would just need to be uh, corrected. There are, uh, before I jump to the next slide, uh, there are a, um, potential side effects you may get during the time of programming, and that usually occurs a month after uh, the uh, stimulators are placed and it gives it time to heal. And they, and they do that with, with good reason because once the stimulators are placed, sometimes there's a bit of swelling around it. And in fact, you might actually have benefit because the swelling is there having some effect uh, um, that's uh, the incisional effect, but uh, after a month, once things settle down and your symptoms are, 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 are back, now this is the time to program it and optimize improvement of your symptoms. And that would be done in your DBS clinic program with your neurology team, your movement disorder specialist, or their nurse or nurse practitioner that might be part of that team as well. Um, the side effects during the programming uh, can occur. Uh, however, that can be adjusted and a different contact where the simulator is can be selected um, in order to minimize those side effects. So those side effects are potentially reversible as part of the programming session. Um, the, what is the response? So DBS can improve the motor symptoms, including tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia. It can also help improve the dyskinesias, dystonia, motor fluctuations. Studies have shown it reduced the off time by over five hours in some studies, and that could, certainly can be throughout the entire day, depending on uh, your response and with adjustments. Um, the response, it, this is very important. The response is equal to your best response on levodopa, just with fewer fluctuations. Um, the, if your tremor, some patients might have good response to levodopa with respect to their slowness and stiffness, uh, but the uh, uh, levodopa might not be as effective for their tremor. And that's not uncommon. Uh, DBS can still help with the tremor, even though levodopa may not. So that's another uh, potential advantage here. Um, you, so you don't have to necessarily wait for fluctuations if your tremor is not as responsive. That could be another indication for pursuing DBS earlier. Um, impairment in cognition, so that's memory, cognitive domains, uh, gait, balance, and speech are less likely to improve and may potentially worsen with DBS. Uh, and we'll go through uh, on the next slide what represents a good DBS candidate. Uh, the, there are studies that do show that the duration of sustained clinical improvement after DBS is reported to be at least 10 years. So what represents a good candidate? I, I want you to focus on the top part of this slide. That's probably the most important. We mentioned this, the adequate response to dopaminergic therapy. It's only as good as your best response to leave the dopa. Uh, the presence of an on and off fluctuations that are fairly disabling. Um, ideally below the age of 70, 
And that's what the study showed too, but that does not mean they won't take someone under 75, between 70 and 75. I have had a few patients that were 72, 73. Uh, you, oftentimes they would pre-screen people um, and that's our standard routine to see what their on and off response to levodopa is. That's one part of the test. Another part is neuropsychological testing and that includes cognitive testing. So uh, patients that are past all of that and are still 72, 73 years old can certainly undergo DBS if they, if they do well. Um, dyskinesia is impairing quality of life, certainly, but the reason for the improvement in dyskinesias is that typically uh, with DBS, you're able to reduce the overall need for levodopa. So let's say you're someone who's had significant fluctuations on levodopa. You were requiring a dose every two to three hours, which is fairly frequent. Uh, the uh, dose was, uh, the good on was causing you quite a bit of dyskinesia, but lowering the dose to reduce the dyskinesia has caused more stiffness, slowness, and tremor. Then um, with, the, with the DBS, it could give you your best response, but with the ability to reduce your overall dose of levodopa, thus reducing the dyskinesia. And so you might be able to go back to one tablet every five, three times a day. Uh, and that might be on, an, on a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly we've seen reductions in the dose of levodopa. The, re the reason for uh, maintaining levodopa is that levodopa may have some additional benefits for some of the non-motor symptoms that we talked about. Um, and so uh, stopping it altogether is not always the case. Uh, Medication-resistant tremor, that's a good DBS candidate and reasonable cognitive function. This is a, I, 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 I like this slide. Many of you may be visual learners and, and this is a mnemonic created by Dr. Okun and, and his group in, in um, at University of, and they developed this mnemonic. And this is also found on the parkinsons.org, the, the US version of the Parkinson's Society website. Uh, so DBS in PD. So these are all things I mentioned, but this is just to emphasize this. D it does not cure. Um, it, 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 bilateral DBS is often required in order to improve gait, although sometimes one-sided unilateral DBS has marked effect on walking. It does smooth out on and off fluctuations. That is the goal of DBS. It improves tremor, stiffness, bradykinesia, dyskinesia in most cases, but may not completely eliminate them. Um, it never improves symptoms that are unresponsive to your best on. We mentioned that. For example, gait or balance, they do not improve. If they do not improve with your best medication response, but your best on levodopa, they are very unlikely to improve with surgery. Uh, programming visits are likely to occur many times during the first six months, and then follow-up visits are required um, typically every six months, occasionally every three to six months, um, and there will be multiple adjustments to the stimulator and in the medications over that period of time. Uh, decrease in medications can occur in many, but not all patients. I'd like to talk about our next available option for those who may not wish to pursue DBS or may not be candidates. Um, so duodopa is uh, levodopa carbidopa, just as you get it in your tablet, but delivered as a gel infusion directly into the gut at the site where levodopa is typically absorbed. So in the jejunum, which is a part of the small intestine. Uh, it is approved for the treatment of motor fluctuations in Parkinson disease. Unlike DBS, there's no age limitation or neurocognitive exclusion to duodopa. However, caregiver assistance is often needed and connecting and so for things like connecting and disconnecting the pump, the device, and also flushing the opening of the tube to make sure it doesn't get blocked. You need care around the tube site, the, what's called the stoma, the opening into the, through the skin into the gut. Uh, so these are all very important things to think about. And it's good to have the same consistent caregiver involved. Um, it does have faster absorption, uh, comparable bioavailability, uh, meaning how it circulates and, re and responds and reduced intra subject variability in levodopa concentrations compared to the oral levodopa. Remember, this is a continuous infusion. So as opposed to taking a tablet, and, and of course there are individual discrepancies on how well it's absorbed. And then, like I said, crosses through the gut transporter, through the bloodstream and up to the brain, that response spikes and lulls and peaks and troughs. So this is more con continuous. And with the absorption issue, we mentioned moving pills away from meals. You don't have to worry about this as much because it's already directly at its uh, site of absorption. 
Um, it, studies have shown it does reduce the mean off time about four hours daily and increased mean on time without trouble dis troublesome dyskinesia at 4.1 hours. That's quite significant. So if you think about someone who's on um, a, a tablet of levodopa every three hours and are still wearing off um, every half an hour, and let's say they're on six times a day, six to seven times a day, uh, this is a significant improvement. Um, uh, with the duodopa, if there is wearing off, because that could happen, uh, you have the option to deliver an additional bolus where you can press on the pump to uh, self-administer uh, an extra bolus if you do experience an off. A one seven-year study showed that 90% of patients reported improvement in quality of life, autonomy, and clinical global, st and global status. This is an impression of how they were doing um, overall. Discontinuation was over time, over two to seven years, was about 19 to 25%. The reason for that was either they, they had a, a reaction to the a treatment, uh, the procedure, the device, or poor compliance with connecting it, disconnecting it, and, 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 uh, proper, and uh, using it routinely as, as directed, and maybe a lack of efficacy in some of those patients. The uh, pump looks like this. Uh, so this is the uh, programmer, okay? There, there, there's, there is a, this is programmed by your neurologist. The titration period after you have the procedure done by typically a gastroenterologist, in some places an interventional radiologist that'll put the tube in, it is a day procedure. In some centers, they might keep you overnight to monitor how you're doing. Usually there's a um, visit the next day or a review with the gastroenterologist or the, or the specialist that, that to place the procedure. Uh, your, your surgeon um, or, or, with the or, with, or with their nurse, uh, nursing team. Um, there is education before with, through the AbbVie Cares program on um, expectations prior to going through it. Um, there is the option to contact another patient who's gone through it to see how they've done with it and their experience and, 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 and in, 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 which is very helpful in making a, a decision on, on this. And there's also a period after about two weeks, we usually wait two weeks before we initiate the programming. So during that two weeks, we allow the site to heal, the, the stoma, uh, the, the opening to, to heal nicely and to uh, close appropriately to the degree we want it to. And, uh, and then we go ahead and um, initiate uh, uh, the programming. And that's usually done over a three day period. And then programming can occur depending on how things go and your response in close contact with, the, with your, uh, with your uh, duodopa team, your movement disorder specialist. And uh, now there, there may be the option for, in some centers for the duodopa nurse through Abdi to uh, provide advice at, the home, at your home in order to have your caregiver uh, provide some programming if you've discussed with your movement disorder specialist that adjustments may be needed. Um, there is the uh, button on the device that can provide the bolus, again, the amount, per bolus dose will be adjusted with your movement disorder specialist and their team. Uh, the uh, tube is uh, brought in initially as a scope by the gastroenterologist by mouth and then through um, transillumination sometimes or under x-ray, depending on who, who's doing this, they would get the tube uh, through the other side through a hole directly through the skin, right? And then the, and then the uh, tube is further guided into the part of your small intestine known as the jejunum. This is outside the body, and this is where you would connect the device, and this port you would flush the device uh, to make sure there's no blockage but when, when, uh, before connecting it and after disconnecting it. When I say that, that's usually because patients are on uh, um, duodopa for about 16 hours per day. For those with overnight symptoms, on few occasions, we can do the overnight dose. However, uh, oftentimes we might tell them, just take your levodopa overnight. But otherwise, if you're sleeping well through the night, then we can wait to connect it in the morning. Wait till you, you start getting your initial dose effect. And then the continuous rate of the pump sets in. And then you, and then you go about your day. Part A is the uh, duodopa cartridge. Part B is the, uh, is the uh, uh, pump itself. Part C is the connection. Part D over here is the gastric port. And part E is the intestinal tubing. So duodopa in Canada, although it's been around in Europe for, for longer, duodopa in Canada has been around since 2013, which is when we had our first patient. Um, and there, as you can see, there are a number of centers across the country. Um, and based on your province, 
uh, you uh, take a look at this uh, uh, map. Uh, I do know that this star here just means that although it is available in Newfoundland, um, it, it's expected to have pub public access soon, where they don't do not have public access as of yet in terms of public coverage. Uh, this is the newest update in terms of data. I don't want to belabor you with all of the, these numbers, but this was a very recent study uh, uh, um, presented at the Movement Disorder Society meeting this year, and it was a virtual conference because of COVID. Uh, this was up to 24 months of follow-up with 196 patients included, 62% just for the demographic, 62% were male, 78% were above or equal to 65, 51% had Parkinson disease of at least 10 years duration. And they were on levodopa for 16 hours per day, or duodopa for 16 hours per day uh, through till month 24 of the study. And I just wanna show you just to better get an idea of visualization. This first graph here um, shows month, so M means month, third month, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months, shows the number of improved off time. So less, so you've recovered 3.9 hours by month 12, of off time, so 3.9 hours less of the less time of being off and more time being on. And this is the improvement of dyskinesia. We're using a, a dyskinesia score that we use. So uh, this is a reduction minus is better. Um, and these are over time that persisted. Uh, and then uh, dyskinesia related pain and disability also reduced. Some of the non-motor symptoms I've also reduced. These are scores, not, not times. And this is very significant. And this final one, which was, which is most interesting, um, looked at uh, modified caregiver strain index. So caregiver burden. And so this improved quality of life and reduced caregiver burden. As you can imagine, someone with who's caring for you and assisting in your care because of those fluctuations and the needs to assist you with your day to day, when you're on your good, but when you're off, which is maybe quite frequent throughout the day, you're having very difficult uh, time with mobilizing and, and, and uh, sustaining your activities of daily living yourself. So this is probably indicative of, given the improvement of the reduction in caregiver strain. So I wanna summarize with this. Which patients to refer to a movement disorder specialist? And certainly do not be shy and have a conversation when you feel it's most appropriate have a conversation now. It might not be that right time. It might be a matter of adjusting your medications, but if it's a rule of thumb as to when to be referred to a movement disorder specialist, I've had patients being referred to me by general neurologists uh, saying, could this patient be a candidate for duodopa? I see them, they have fluctuations, sure. They have dyskinesias, absolutely. And, and I, I, I visit with them. I take time getting their history and their current presentation, where they're at now, review their medications, and I say, well, you certainly could be a, a candidate for DDS or Duodopa, and I may adjust their medications. I'll see them within three months and, and review uh, their response. I'll bring them back, and if they're not responding as well as ideal, they're still having a lot of fluctuations, we might pursue DBS or Duodopa. But I found that in, if you are referred to movement disorder specialists with those fluctuations, they might be able to uh, circumnavigate some of those um, uh, 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 medication issues and maybe even to able to make some recommendations in terms of adjustments in your medications or some of the new add-ons we have available to smooth out your day and we may not need DBS or Duodopa right at that time. But given the, given the known progression we've discussed earlier, there it will be a point where this may be necessary and, and, and need to be discussed again and I don't want anybody in the audience or the neurologists or caregivers uh, or, or even physicians that might be uh, viewing this talk uh, to uh, hesitate to refer when felt uh, appropriate. And here are some pearls for you. So certainly patients with Parkinson's disease, and they have to have idiopathic classic Parkinson's disease, not a, a, uh, um, a, a another cousin or Parkinson plus syndromes, as we would call them, uh, taking five or more doses of daily uh, 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 levodopa. So that's key, the five. Uh, um, doses, uh, fluctuations impairing activities of daily living, which we talked about uh, often on motor or non-motor symptoms, and uh, troublesome dyskinesia that affect quality of life. So for questions, as uh, Carrie mentioned earlier, we're going to table those for the end, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and we will now hear from our um, patients who have been gracious enough to share their journeys with us. 
um, Dan and Dale, uh, who have undergone treatment with device-aided therapies. So I'm gonna unshare my screen here and I'll leave it to Carrie to introduce. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizek. That was just like a wonderful educational presentation with some really great practical advice. So thank you so much. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Carrie Norquay, and I work as a community engagement coordinator with our programming team at Parkinson Canada. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next two uh, guests to this webinar. Um, Dan Steele and Dale Vance um, have been gracious enough, as Dr. Rizik mentioned, to, to join us today and share some of the, their personal experiences which um, we just think is so important as well, just to get a better um, picture in its entirety. So quickly, I'm gonna share a very short bio from both of these gentlemen, just so we can get to know them a little bit better before we hear from them. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with Dale. Um, Dale Vance shared this. Good afternoon, I'm very pleased to be here with you. My name is Dale Vance and I live with my wife, Martha in Burnaby, BC. I was diagnosed with this wonderful disease, Parkinson's, in 2005. One of the first of many traits that I noticed was I did not do as well in the cold, hence the move from Yellowknife to BC and retirement. That lasted a year, then I started taking stock trading courses and haven't stopped. I still work out daily. I think it is for us that have Parkinson's so important to exercise both the body and the brain. Thank you, Dale, so much for sharing that. And, and uh, Dan, Dan, if you wanna give a quick wave, uh, Dan Steele uh, shared this. Um, Dan was a programmer analyst with the PEI provincial government with more than 25 years of public service. He received his Parkinson's disease diagnosis approximately 10 years ago. At age 43, his symptoms had progressed to the point where he felt he could no longer continue with a lot of the physical activities that he enjoyed. Cold weather in particular was a significant trigger for his tremors. Dan lives in Cornwall, Prince Edward Island, the gentle province with son Michael, who will be soon be 14 years old. Since the deep brain stimulation surgery that he received in July of this year, Dan has been able to resume many of his former interests. He's also very active in the Prince Edward Island chapter of uh, Parkinson Canada. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you both um, to this. And I'm, I just, what I hope to do is just have a little chat with you both. Um, Thanks, Gary. Yes. Yeah. And Dale, I know I can't see your, your face or I think the video is off, but I'm hoping you can still hear me, Dale. Can you hear me okay? We'll see if, uh, we'll start with Dan maybe, if that's okay, sure. Dan. Um, so we know that speaking up can be a hard thing to do. And I'm wondering if you could share with our, with our participants here, um, how did you know that it was time to talk to your neurologist and how did you bring it up? Well, I had frequented the, uh, the Halifax conferences that we used to, to run annually. And uh, through that, I, I became introduced to, to uh, DBS and even though I originally thought that it was really just for people that were further along in their disease, the more I, I learned about DBS, the more I realized that I, I was exactly what they were looking for. Wonderful. That's great. And so I know you just had DBS not that long ago. Yes. yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with me um, just some of the positive impacts that having DBS has had on your life so far. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm able to resume a lot of the activities that I used to do, like, uh, home cooking, preparing meals, uh, indoor gardening, cycling, just a gamut of things, you know, it's just reopened my world. And uh -huh. really, really the, uh, the biggest plus is that now I can spend more time with my son. That is wonderful, Dan. I'm sure that means a lot to Michael as well. So thank you for that. And Dale, I know that um, you are living with the Duodopa pump. And I'm wondering if you could just maybe share with everyone on the webinar. Oh, there you go. <laughs> He's showing us in uh, real life here, the pump. That's wonderful. 
And um, can you just let me know sort of how it came about for you that you decided to, um, to try this? Dale, you got to check your mic there, bud. We'll just give Dale a second here. I don't know, Dale, on the, on the bottom of your screen, if you uh, click on the mic there, that might help. Yeah. Come on, we want to hear your sexy voice, man. <laughs> Still can't hear you there, Dale. I know Dale, I had a, a wonderful chance to spend some time getting to know Dale. Um, and I know he shared um, before having uh, the pump. Um, oh, there he is. There you okay. are. Good. Then I don't have to speak for you, Dale. Wonderful. If you want to hear a little bit about that, I've been saved you're, by the you're, bell. <laughs> you're doing fine. You're doing great. So for me, like I said, I, I was quite sick. And I was, to the point where I, I needed help. I, I, I know something didn't happen soon. I probably wouldn't be here. So I, I, so I happened to hear about Dudopa. What's my doctor and said, I want that. And he said, no. So I thought about and the next day I went back there again and said, no, I really want that. So he said, yes. And uh, the, the, the day I had it put in, I went, went home and I hadn't talked on the phone in probably about five years. And at 10, 10, 10 at night, which is, I should be asleep normally, by five, I was I was phoning my brother to talk to him because he has Parkinson's too. So we're talking. I, I couldn't believe it. The next day, the, the second day, I'm back to the gym. I, I just felt great. So wow. I went from I went from laying in bed where I could not move. I was always paralyzed to going back to the gym and then going out. And then and recently, it's been, it's been three years now. I, I quit driving because I, I was I was freezing too much. Started started driving again about a month ago. Love that. Wow. Yeah. Tell me, Dale, how did that feel? Um, I know you oh, shared yes. a story about your, your Porsche that you had kind of yeah. in your garage for years and you got to take it like, out. Can you share I that? I bought a Porsche 22 years ago and I got the same car and it's just like new. So I was I, I always thought I'm getting back in that car no matter what. So three years later I did and it, it, it felt like I was just get out of, getting out of jail. Wow. You know, it was like a, when you can't drive, you can't go anywhere. So I, I, got, I got in the car and I just had freedom. Right on. Wow. Oh, great. Isn't oh, great. that wonderful? I know, Dan, you shared with me a story about getting back on your bike yeah. after years of not being able to do that and just that feeling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, being able to get out onto a trail that I. <sighs> yeah. Well, you know, Dan, when I got in that car, I, just, I hit the gas and I just, I don't, I don't do that, but I hit the gas and just flew. I thought I'm alive. Yeah. 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 Get getting to do stuff that you, you didn't think you'd be able to do. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Like a new lease on life, right, Dan? I think you That's said, right. right? That feeling of pure joy. That is wonderful. Um, I know that a lot of people that are watching this webinar right now uh, may be thinking about whether this is an option for them. Um, is there anything that either of you think is important that they, along with their healthcare team, their family members, um, need to know uh, just in preparing to go through something like that. I would say if you're getting to the point where you're laying in bed too much and you can't get out, it's, it's time to get help. And the help's out there, so go, go, go get it. And don't take no for an answer. Exactly. Yeah. I, I would also add to that that, you know, there's a lot of people that will just take their family doctors or their neurologist's word on, on what they want. And much like Dale was saying earlier, sometimes you just got to be your own advocate and just push for what you need. I mean, only you really know if if you can continue to, to go on with the way things are. You really need to be your own advocate and push. I know I, knew I couldn't. I need help. You need help. So I guess it's almost um, realizing that you do need help and not being afraid to ask for it. No, you and have, ask you have those to. questions. The problem is you, you don't know what's out there. Like I, I, I had not heard of do it open until probably a month before I asked for it. I hadn't heard of it, so you don't know you yeah. didn't ask. I agree totally. I mean, really, you need to be educated because, quite frankly, if you're going to advocate for yourself, you need to know what you're talking about. 
So yeah, find out for yourself or find somebody that can help you learn that. Do a lot, do, do a lot of reading. Yes. All right. So educate yourself is really important. Very important. All right. Um, for either of you, were there any challenges? Um, you know, I know these are not um, simple procedures at all. Um, were there any challenges or things that you maybe wish you had have known before just to prepare your, yourselves better? Is there anything you can share with the audience about that? You know, I can say that there are problems, problems with the pump, yeah, problems with, with the tube and stuff. But overall, it, my, life, my lifestyle was 10 times better. Yeah. So those, those few problems I, I can live with. Well, for the D, the uh, DBS, which uh, I had some experience with through other members of our chapter and, and support group, I knew a bit about it. But uh, what I jokingly talked to other people that I talked to about DBS is, is the uh, – the vanity issue, which is that, uh, as an example, for instance, my sister keeps joking that I had my horns cut off, right? Because there's bumps and lumps and stuff on my head. And so I, I said to uh, another fellow who was contemplating having it, I said, listen, if you got any vanity around you, you might as well not do this surgery because you're going to have lumps and bumps and elephants and all. Or, or whole or chest. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. It's, it's funny, too, because last night Michael came up to me. He heard me listening to a, a video that Dale had put me on to. And he was saying, what are you watching? And I said, well, it's got something on DBS here. And he's, he uh, looked at it, and he was asking me about my, my, uh, my DBS. And I said, put your hand here, Michael. And he touched my head. He said, ooh. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Man, yeah. does that hurt? I said, no, nope, it doesn't hurt. He says, well, why did you do that? I said, well, it's because I do more stuff with you. I just wanted that also, you know, this is a, really a team, team, team effort. Yourself, your doctor, my doctor, Dozzle, my neurologist, a great man. My, uh, sur my surgeon was Dr. Gray. Again, I I've been a pain. I know I have. <laughs> he's, been great. He's, been, he's, been, he's been great. So, awesome. and, and the nurses too. The nurses are fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to talk, I'd like to thank my my team as well because absolutely fabulous, Doctor Visa, Christine, Peggy, Doctor Heather Rigby, all fantastic folks. And the uh, sponsor, I'll, I'll, I'll be. I'm so glad to hear that you both have had uh, such wonderful experiences and. Um, had such a great, strong team around you. And I think that's so important to have that relationship with very, your, very important. your healthcare team. And then also your, the people that love you at home and your friends and your neighbors and your community as well. So well, I, will, I will say that Dr. No, Dr. Stozel saved my life. I, I wouldn't be here. So. Wow. Isn't that great? I, I want to ask you each if there, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself before having this done, um, what is the one thing you would say to yourself of what to look forward to after this. You know what? I wouldn't have known. I, I couldn't believe it. it was, I was so much, so much better. I couldn't, could not believe it. But I went back about 10 years. Wow. Yeah, I'd say back. anecdotally, I probably went back about five or six for sure. But I'll tell you one anecdote. My, my neighbor across the street, he was the first one to really notice something besides people hearing me, me with my voice and saying, Hey, Dan, it sounds like the old Dan, for instance. Right. Yeah. But he, he really painted a picture when he told me that Dan, I saw you walking down the road the other day and I didn't say hi to you because I didn't think it was you. Your <laughs> gait had changed. Your, your, you know, you're yeah. moving your arms and stuff and your gait had changed. I didn't think it was you. So I didn't say hi. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, and I know I'm cognizant of time because I know we could chat for, for hours, all of us. Yeah. Um, but I, what I would love, um, you know, just knowing that there's people watching this webinar right now that are, are thinking about this and are at a point where maybe you both were at um, in the past. Um, if there was one maybe um, wisdom or advice that you could share, um, could, could you each maybe do that for us? Uh, go ahead, Dan. Okay. First of all, as, uh, as Dr. Rizik uh, mentioned, it's not a cure. My, my mother was saying, well, Dan, I thought you were cured. I said, Mom, it's not a cure. I mean, I'm doing a hell of a lot better, but, you know, it, it's 
doesn't fix any of the, the uh, non-motor symptoms. It's important to realize that. And one of my big problems was, uh, was fatigue, apathy, uh, depression, anxiety, all that stuff. I drool quite a bit, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to solve any of those. So if you think you're going in for a one-shot deal cure, it's not for you. But the improvements are immense and very worth it. So on that front, I'd say anybody considering it just has to, to get real and understand what they're getting into. That's, that's my piece of wisdom. Well, I think there's a say, phase six here, not, not, not just five. Phase six is I'm getting better all the time. Wonderful. So you're still seeing improvement. That's great. I am. Well, I thank you both so much. Um, we'll invite Dr. Rizik back as well because um, you know, we had some questions submitted um, when people registered and um, Dr. Rizik was so thorough in his uh, presentation that I think he answered just about every uh, question that had come in before. Um, but there was one question and I think um, all three of you really can contribute to it. Um, we had someone ask whether, um, depending on where you lived, if you lived at a distance from some of these major centers that perform mm -hmm. these procedures, um, now, what does that look like? Is, is that something that should discourage you or what, what do you need to be aware of when you maybe aren't living so close uh, geographically? I think that's from Dan. Well, I can speak to that for sure. Um, it shouldn't discourage people, but it will quite often, especially here in the Maritimes where the closest center is at least four, four hours each way. And uh, for a lot of aged people, quite frankly, that, that's quite a barrier. But, um, you know, financially, there's a lot of support. Uh, I happen to be in a privileged position with a good insurance policy that covers a lot of the, the costs and whatnot of travel and whatnot, and if I have to stay. But, uh, you know, don't let it be a barrier if you can in any way, shape, or form go after it. Because, I mean, if you've got friends that live in neighboring provinces, just find a way to stay there for a couple of days or what have you, mm -hmm. do it that way. And oh, that? Right. We, we, there's lots of people that are, are more than willing to drive people too. Go ahead, Dale. I was going to say, if you're feeling bad and you know, you think you're kind of feeling it's, it's over, you're depressed, you don't, see, you don't see an end, this is the way you have to go. You can't say no to yourself or to your family. You have to, you have to go ahead and try this. Yeah. I've got a hole in my chest room. It's not good. Who, who cares? No big deal. Quality of life, my friend. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's great. Dr. Rizek, do you have anything to answer with that question? Uh, thanks so much, Dan and Dale. It's, it's wonderful hearing your journeys and your experience and positive experiences too. So it's very encouraging and uh, it's, it's, it's great that um, people that are listening to this and are considering this have some insight into how you're doing. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for that. Right. And thank you, Dan, you're, you're in a, you're in a unique experience in terms of having to have traveled to get your, big procedure done but oh, yeah. you're, you're letting these people know that for you it was worthwhile absolutely yeah thank you and i even overcome covid to get it i was originally scheduled for march and guess what my surgery got canceled i had to go back a second time ah. determined yeah <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it, it, it flew by the time I know for me, um, our hour is up. And I just honestly, on behalf of everyone at Parkinson Canada, I just want to thank all three of you for um, just really a wonderful hour full of some great information, some wonderful personal experiences. And um, I thank you all so much. We thank you. And just reminding everyone, um, if you have questions about these procedures, um, you're looking for more information. I know um, Stan had included in the chat um, an infographic on the Duodoco pump. You can also reach out to Parkinson Canada at our information and referral line. That number is 1-800-565-3000. Or you can always go to our website at www.parkinson.ca. Um, we wish you all a, a safe and happy holiday and looking forward to connecting in the new year. So again, thank you so much. And in my case, they can pull me too. Thanks, Dale. Happy holidays. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.